the bad guys won. This is the perfect crime. They ripped off America. They ripped off the savings of a generation. No one will ever know really what they took. It's said a man with a pen can steal more than a man with a gun. But the simple click of a mouse could be the most dangerous weapon of all. Every day while you're out working hard just to scrape by, Wall Street insiders are exploiting a flaw in the financial system to commit the perfect crime. They are selling stock that doesn't exist. When I first heard the term naked short selling, I had no clue as to what they were mentioning. Illegal naked short selling is the practice of selling stock you don't own, getting paid for it, and then never delivering the shares. We thought to ourselves, that's impossible. That can't be. The government oversees this. It's a bigger problem than I ever anticipated. People were losing their jobs, people were losing their families. Have you ever heard of naked short selling? Naked short selling? Naked short selling is, is it stock counterfeiting. The sheer volume is astounding. On any given day, there are between 500 million and 1 billion shares that have been sold and failed to deliver. And that can force a stock's price to plummet. Over the course of uh, seven, eight, nine months, the stock went from $8 per share till it ultimately reached two cents. Illegal naked short selling has driven thousands of companies into the ground. This is a crack in our market that could bring down the country. And it's still going on. And if we're not outraged by it, then frankly, we deserve what we get. Tonight, the Dow plummets as the financial world is rocked. Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. AIG scrambling to try and raise cash. On September 15th, 2008, the economy of the United States was crumbling. It had begun a year earlier when the U.S. housing bubble burst. By spring 2008, investment bank Bear Stearns was rumored to be folding. A shotgun marriage between Bear Stearns and J.P. Morgan and an infusion of $30 billion by the federal government was used to help stop the widening fears sweeping through Wall Street. Then came the virtual collapse of mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Finally, with the closing of Lehman Brothers Investment Bank, the stock market crashed and credit markets froze. The American people are concerned about the situation in our financial markets. The economy had virtually imploded. Today, the effects are still with us. But years before, a small group of people sounded the alarm, hoping to warn us about the potential disaster before it happened. They came from all walks of life, some were activists like Mark Fogg and Dave Patch, stockbrokers like Darren Saunders, economists Suzanne Trimbath and Robert Shapiro, lawyers Wes Christian and John O'Quinn, and entrepreneurs Patrick Byrne and Rod Young. I pursued my dream in Florida. I became a general contractor, a builder, and a developer. One of the biggest problems in that business was communicating with people. The inefficiency and the money lost from a failed communication could sometimes amount to thousands of dollars. Being an amateur computer guru at the time, I created a virtual telephone system. The system that Rod came up with allowed people to utilize a single phone number that followed them from phone to phone, no matter where they were. 
at home, in the office, or on their cell phone. It was a revolutionary idea that was years ahead of its time. I decided to just take the ball and run with it. There were a number of people who kept telling me, this is the most fabulous thing that I've ever seen. How can I get this? And of course, the answer was, well, you can't. This is something that, that I dreamed up and I invented. We looked for a period of three years before we were able to find the capital to launch the company. Rod's friends and family invested in Eagle Tech. There's a cliche, don't bet the farm. My family actually sold a 100-acre farm and invested the money in Eagle Tech Communications to get it off the ground. Rod decided to take his company public, but Eagle Tech needed more capital to continue moving forward. Enter financier John Cerubo. He and his partners knew Rod had something unique. Had a lot of sizzle. Technology companies were hot at the time. Also, uh, telco companies were hot at the time, and this fit both criteria. They had um, finished their development stage, and um, they were ready to go on to their marketing stage. The firm that they had picked to do that, that we helped them with an introduction to, was Solomon Smith Barty. Cerubo and his partners loaned the company money in exchange for shares of Eagle Tech stock. They took us to Solomon Smith Barney at Seven World Trade Center in New York. We thought that uh, we had died and gone to heaven. We were just ecstatic that a major firm would be uh, interested in, in our little company. To add to the good news, Rod learned that a patent for his technology was about to be issued. There were only a handful of people that knew about this. Suddenly, the trading volume of Eagle Tech inexplicably shot up tenfold. It looked like someone was trying to create and sustain investor demand for Eagle Tech stock. We knew that there was a rat in the woodpile somewhere. Something was going on. Someone was leaking inside information. Behind the scenes, Solomon Smith Barney and Cerubo were leaking information to manipulate Eagle Tech's stock price even paying kickbacks to unscrupulous brokers to pump or hype the stock. This allowed them to sell their stock at a higher price. When you have all the ingredients, you're gonna bake the cake. And when you get the ducks to quack, you feed them. Rod Young was about to come face to face with catastrophe. But he wasn't the first or the last. In 1989, Darren Saunders was a naive New York kid who wanted to make it big on Wall Street. He had no clue what he was getting himself into. I was 22 years old. Uh, my brother-in-law, John, was working at a firm trading, and he told me about how much money all the guys were making, and he would say to me, like, he liked my rap. Like, he's like, Liz, you, you could sell ice to an Eskimo. I think you could do it. You could do, make some big numbers down there. So I was like, all right, I'll go. And that's how it all started, 1989. Then, Darren came across a small medical research company that looked like it could become very successful. It was called Virogen. I met a girl at work, his brother was on trial with the uh, Virogen drug, and he had multiple sclerosis. He was in a wheelchair and blind, and when he was one of the studies, he was out of the wheelchair and he got his sight back. I figured, Here's a company that has something, looks like it really could be the next best thing. So I figure I got it made. Scientist Gerald Smith became involved with Virogen for more personal reasons. I first became aware of Virogen uh, when my second spouse was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, bone cancer, and uterine cancer. My wife then was given uh, approximately 90 days to live. What we did is uh, seek some alternate uh, treatment. And right in my own backyard in Plantation, Florida, we discovered Biogen and the product, which was then known as Omniferon, a natural interferon. The drug had not yet been approved for use nationally, but Florida law allowed Jerry's wife to try Virogen on an experimental basis. All the cancers went into remission. The doctors were shaking their heads 
And they said, whatever you're doing, keep doing it because this is wonderful. The success of the product was just multiplying. They were doing deals with the German Red Cross, Swedish Red Cross, blood agencies everywhere, Sloan Kettering. Things were going well for Virogen. In 2005, it was named by CBS Business Network as a stock to watch. But not long after, Virogen's stock prices began to drop. The sudden fall in price pointed to the probability that there was short selling going on in Virogen's stock. Short selling is the way that an investor can make money when his instinct is that the price of a stock is going to go down rather than up. The way it works is you borrow shares from someone who already owns them. You sell those shares at the current market price. And then if the investor is right that the price is going to decline, when it falls, you go back into the market, you buy the shares on the open market at the lower price, and you replace the borrowed shares with the ones you bought. The fear is that in times of financial crisis, short selling will increase the downturn. But the concept isn't new. It's been around for more than 400 years. In fact, in 1610, the Dutch enacted the first edict against short selling when the burgeoning tulip market's bubble burst in Holland. But the practice of naked short selling can cause even more havoc. Normally, when you sell something, you have to either own it or borrow it, and you have to deliver it. You get paid for it, you gotta deliver what you paid for. In a naked short sale, the naked short seller never delivers the shares. The seller sold something they didn't own, the buyer thinks they own something they don't, and the buyer parted with good money to the seller. It has the effect of making it seem as if there are more shares than actually exist. And that can drive a company's stock into the ground. I remember getting a telephone call from my chief financial officer saying there's millions of shares that are being shorted. At the time, because the stock had risen so quickly, we expected a reasonable number of shorts, which is uh, acceptable in, in any company that's public. But there was a disproportionate number of shares that were being shorted in terms of the natural marketplace. And when you counted out all the shares being sold, there was something wrong. There were too many shares being sold each day. There were too much action in the markets. It's like the market kept getting hit. It kept getting hit. It kept getting hit. And I'm like, what's going on here? I would look at the, the numbers. No big holders were selling. Nobody's selling. Yet where's all the stock coming from? Virgin had a shareholder meeting in Florida. I left LaGuardia checking out where the stock was, 15 sixteenths. And I bought it at a dollar and a sixteenth. So I'm like, uh, today, hopefully, they come out with some good news. And maybe at the shareholder meeting, something will come out. Maybe the stock will bump up a little bit. And then I get to Florida. I call up. And Vibage is trading at 13, 30 seconds, which is like 33 cents. And I remember I just hysterical crying, saying to myself, I hope on the way back, the plane blows up. Today, wheeling and dealing on Wall Street occurs at lightning speed. General Electric, 39 and 7, But in the early days, buying and selling stocks was simpler and much slower. As you would send a runner down with physical stock certificates, and that person would get on their bicycle or walk down, and they would exchange stock for cash or an IOU or a cashier's check. They actually had to locate and deliver paper shares and get them from one building to another, sometimes in the same city, sometimes a continent away. When people were trading and it was paper that was being delivered, you knew what you were getting. If you gave money to a broker and they gave you a piece of paper, then you knew you had that share. Since its creation in 1934, the Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, regulated the system. But the process broke down in the 1960s when up to 15 million shares a day traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Stock certificates piled up in offices, many were lost and never made it to their destinations. The volume of trading was increasing. And all the records for 
what was being bought, what was being sold, and tracking the settlement of every trade. That was done largely with pencil and paper. Many firms actually folded because their records were so fouled up they couldn't balance their books. Wall Street was drowning in paperwork. So brokers turned to computers. High-speed computers were used to solve the thousands of problems. A new wave of electronic trading was born, and that changed everything. Yes, sir! <laughs> Let's transfer the stock electronically. We could go from a stock certificate paper-based system to sort of a paperless system. Eventually, the registered brokers of the stock exchange created the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, or DTCC, which matches buyers and sellers of electronic trades. The DTCC now holds in electronic form all of the accounts of the major brokers. It's actually privately held, but it carries out a public trust. This big computerized entity watches every transaction in the market. Key element was making sure that whenever they hit the button that said the stock gets electronically transmitted, that they had the stock. And that's exactly where the loophole was. In the early 90s, Suzanne Trimbath was working for the DTCC. One day, she was approached by some transfer agents who are hired by public companies to keep track of who owns each share of stock. They explained to me, and they helped me to understand that short sales and stock lending increased the number of shares in circulation. This meant that during corporate elections, shareholders were voting on more shares than were actually available. In corporate elections, shareholders get a vote for each share of stock. One share, one vote. But because of this overvoting, the transfer agents believed that there were more shares in the market than the companies had issued. Somehow, phantom shares were making their way into the system. They asked me if I would talk with the senior management at DTC to see if they would work with them on a solution. And I went to the senior managers there, and they said, that they wouldn't do anything about it because you can't balance the world. And I remember thinking that that wasn't a very good answer. They couldn't keep track of who owned the shares and who had the rights to vote, and they thought it was a, a fairly small problem. 10 years later, Trim Bath, now an economist working in the private sector, was contacted by Wes Christian, a lawyer who was examining phenomenon similar to what she had experienced in 1993. He sat me down at a coffee shop somewhere in midtown Manhattan, and he heard that I used to work at DTC, and he said that he would like to talk with me. And he drew for me on the back of a napkin this idea that he had. He laid out the scenario. It looks as if more shares are being sold than exist and here's the degree to which we think it's happening. And he laid out the scenario of how the shares were multiplied. And when he did, I just remember being so surprised that an idea that someone had brought to me 10 years earlier was once again being presented to me. Only this time, instead of telling me, this is what's happening, he's asking me, is this happening? And so, of course, my answer was yes, this, you're, this absolutely happens. In 2003, Wes Christian had teamed up with fellow Texas attorney John O'Quinn, renowned for taking on and defeating the tobacco industry. O'Quinn and Christian were representing several clients who saw the value of their companies destroyed when their stock prices collapsed. How I first became involved is somebody actually from uh, the church that Mr. O'Quinn and I both attend contacted us and said that he could not understand where all the shares of stock that were being sold was coming from each day in the stock market. We believe somebody's selling stock that doesn't exist. We thought to ourselves, that's impossible. That can't be. The SEC oversees this. The DTC oversees this. The government oversees this. Wes Christian and John O'Quinn were looking at a case of naked short selling where stock is sold short but never borrowed, creating what is known in the market as a fail to deliver. 
It's a situation where stock is sold to a buyer, but the broker never delivers the shares. The felt to deliver in 1993 was about $1.6 billion total. By 2003, it was $6 billion. It looks as if somewhere between 93 and 2003, somebody figured out that there was a hole in the system. Somebody figured out that there was this little uh, loophole, or this little, this little crack in the system where you could actually just make money by selling shares that didn't exist. And that the system itself would never stop you. There's no punishment for it. There's no um, fines or fees, or there's no one saying you broke the rules, you can't play anymore, and, and had really begun to exploit it and really began to make a lot of money out of it. The hole in the system that Suzanne uncovered would lead to something bigger than she could ever have imagined. But the hole in the system for Darren Saunders had immediate repercussions. One day I had the idea and I said, listen, I can't take this anymore. I started saying, I need to do something. People need to know what's going on in Virgin's market. I had the bright idea. I think I was watching a cartoon where they had the guy with the sandwich board. I said, hey, that looks cool. Maybe I'll make a picket sign and circle the exchange and get the newspapers or somebody to do something. For like, say, the months of July and most of August, I circled the New York Stock Exchange at least two or three times a day. Every day doing it, circling the exchange. I had brokers badmouth me, attack me. I remember I had one guy come out from the New York Stock Exchange scream at me saying, get out of here, get out of here. What are you doing here? The SEC is in Washington, D.C. Why don't you go there? Why don't you leave us alone? What am I doing? I'm just here to say the SEC isn't doing their job and I went to the Securities Exchange Commission in D.C. And then when I got there with the sign, they were, they were like saying, like, get out of here, what are you doing? You can't be here, you can't be here. And I just kept doing this and kept doing this and kept doing it and kept making my payments. And it's just like, I'm saying, when is this gonna end? Meanwhile, 1,400 miles away in Houston, Texas, famed lawyer John O'Quinn was featured in Forbes magazine leveling his guns at Wall Street in an article exposing naked short selling. While back in Florida, Rod Young, CEO of Eagle Tech, received a rude awakening. In one of the lowest of low moments, um, I received a fax one day from the CEO of another company. He thought my company was being attacked by securities manipulators, and he directed me to uh, West Christian and John O'Quinn. Christian and O'Quinn were still investigating the threat of naked short selling to small companies. They began to represent Eagle Tech. The first thing we figured out is there were millions and millions of shares being sold that didn't exist. And when we began discovery, we got some very lucky breaks. Those breaks consisted of the FBI starting a parallel investigation on the criminal side. Of the Eagle Tech case, it was sort of the stepping stone uh, case in this uh, in stock fraud investigations. And that case, for the first time to me, I realized that there is an organized crime factor in this. Wall Street decided to team up with organized crime. They even went a step further and put somebody inside Eagle Tech as a requirement of the financing. So in order for Eagle Tech to get the financing, they had to hire certain people as management. They brought in three directors, a CEO, a securities attorney. For John Cerubo, it was time to bake the cake and feed the ducks. Rod Young agreed to allow us to put our own CEO in, board of directors. Which actually ended up being people that were insiders for organized crime and Wall Street. It was um, a very nice situation. I wasn't really involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. Ultimately, what that meant is that Eagle Tech was doomed. When a company like Eagle Tech walks in the door with a story and a technology that actually has something behind it, and you have a CEO that basically will do as you say, you have all the makings of what you need. 
The strategy had two phases. At first, the conspirators lined their pockets by manipulating the price of Eagle Tech's stock up to dump their shares. Now, they schemed to drive the price down. That way, the crooks made even more money as it dropped. And when the loan was due, they would get so many shares of the stock that they would gain control of Rod's company and the technology he had invented. There was no floor in the price of the stock that the Solomon Smith Barney and the Paradigm Group could buy the stock at. So it was to their advantage, one, for the price of the stock to drop, because then they could buy the stock at a cheaper price. The lenders found a way to guarantee that the price of the stock would drop by flooding the market with phantom shares. It's called death spiral financing because it ultimately kills the companies under attack. Automatically, when you flood the market with phantom shares and you dilute the supply of real shares, you make the market think that there are really more shares for sale than there are shares, you force down the price of stock. This is not a harmless prank here. Many of these companies, they'd sold their shares, they'd had a public offering, they sold their 10 million shares, a dollar a share, and uh, lo and behold, they saw their stock, let's say it was $10 a share, go down to 10 cents or a penny. Over the course of uh, seven, eight, nine months, the stock uh, went from uh, $8 per share on the day that we did the secondary financing uh, it was a slow death spiral uh, till it ultimately reached uh, about two cents where it stayed for three years. After O'Quinn and Christian filed their lawsuits on behalf of Eagle Tech, Rod Young refused to give up the hundreds of millions of shares to the corrupt lenders. But because the stock price was so low, it was impossible to raise money to fund his struggling company. The company never had a chance. You know, the company never had a chance, even though the owner of this company is a legitimate person. He was trying to make something that he felt was going to be something significant to our society, but he never had a chance. It's all about the money. While Rod Young's company was being destroyed from within, Darren Saunders continued his lonely one-man vigil picketing in New York and Washington, D.C. Have you ever heard of the term naked short selling? Counterfeiting on Wall Street. Yeah, of course. Have you, ever, have you ever heard of naked short selling? And as he studied naked short selling in depth on the internet, he found others as concerned as he was. When I first got involved with the internet, I started just scrambling around, and I ran into another company that was speaking about naked short selling, or speaking about counterfeiting, and I was like, wow, that sounds like Virogen. This led Darren to Dave Patch, an engineer and designer of fuel systems for jet engines. Patch had also witnessed unusual trading patterns in one of his investments. It spiraled down. It went down from $20 to, to $10 almost overnight. And when I started to ask what happened, I was introduced to naked short selling. I read things and you look at the trade volumes and everything else, but there was never any disclosure of data behind the trade volumes. Dave suspected fails to deliver might explain it. He decided to file Freedom of Information Act requests in order to gather fails to deliver data on various companies. I found that when stocks were going down, fails to deliver went up. In almost every case, phantom shares were flooding the market as the stock prices crashed. It's a bigger problem than I ever anticipated and people were losing their jobs, people were losing their families, people were losing their homes. They would lost everything because of this. There was large-scale naked short sale attacks on hundreds and hundreds of small young companies that had come up in the economic boom of the 1990s, uh, hundreds of which were destroyed. Like Darren Saunders, Dave Patch decided to organize his own protest. He decided to go into New York City and step in front of the NASDAQ building and make a storm, create a rally. Dave went online to enlist support. 
got commitments of several hundred people that were going to show up in New York City, but um, not many people did. I think in all total there was maybe 12 people that showed up. One of the 12 was Darren. We the people should get together and stop it. And Darren and I took turns getting into the back of my pickup truck with a, with a bullhorn mic. I'm in a three-piece suit, and I'm dressed nicely. And I would get people that would listen, but they weren't getting the message. And then I would hand the mic over to Darren, and Darren would just yell at them. What are you guys, nuts? You don't know what the crisis is going on. They're picking your pockets, and people flocked. They're listening to this guy yell at him. He could create this firestorm. That was really a great day for me because I've been on this road all by myself for so many years, and to see somebody else here, I was like, it was so nice. I was like, I'm not here alone anymore. Frustrated by the lack of response to the rally, Dave Patch decided to take another approach. I want regulators and I want Congress to know about naked short selling and to do something about it, so why don't I start a website and a website petition petition the SEC and Congress to investigate and hold hearings on naked short selling. It wasn't long before Dave began to get some unexpected visitors to his website. All the big brokerage houses were going on to the site. Goldman Sachs, Bear Stearns, and Merrill Lynch. I had Department of Justice, the Senate, House, state regulators, the U.S. courts, the IRS, your moms and pops. I knew that the message was getting out. Around the same time, Mark Falk, another crusader against naked short selling, wrote an article on his website entitled Financial Terrorism in America. In the first week, this article got a million hits on a brand new website, which kind of just blew me away. It wasn't long before Falk's interest in the issue grew into an obsession. I got hundreds and hundreds of emails, people telling me their stories, people saying, if anything, you're just kind of hitting the tip of the iceberg here, and then there's much more to it. I wrote another article, um, and then I wrote another. But the increased visibility also brought vicious attacks on Falk and Patch from online posters on internet message boards. I began to get bashed by these people that I had no clue who they were. And uh, so I had one group saying, yeah, I'll expose this. This is, this is a story that needs to be told. And another group saying, you're a bunch of idiots. What are you talking about? You have no clue what you're doing. A lot of the bashing and rumors emanated from stock message boards, such as Raging Bull. The message boards are really dirty, scummy, sewer pit of manipulation and deceit. There's money involved on the message boards. The bashing was nothing new. The personal attacks against Falk and Patch were used in the same way message boards had spread misinformation and fear to destroy Rod Young's company, Eagle Tech. There's a lot of talk about rumors, and this it's clear that the whisper mill can frighten people even more. Gee, something is radically wrong with this company. People must know something that I don't know. And so the long-term investors panic and start selling their shares too, and pretty soon, kaput. Everyone has zero. And so that's it. I realized that there was money involved here beyond what I understood. Because nobody would go in and violate federal laws against me unless there was a good reason why they were doing it. Bashing became abusive to the point of uh, stalking and harassment, the 2.30 phone calls in the morning. I've had my social security number posted on the internet, my mortgage information, my family's name, my children's name, the ages. My stock brokerage account was hacked into when I was on vacation and uh, um, they started selling my stock. But the adversity didn't stop any of the Crusaders. Instead, others joined their cause and the movement to stop naked short selling grew. We all had our own personalities and we all wanted to do the things our own way. We fed off each other, but we were disjointed. I referred to us once as the dirty dozen, and I did that because we were this very unlikely group of advocates. We were like the oddest group you'd ever, ever meet. And it wasn't long before the unlikeliest one of all made his way to Mark Falk's website. Have you ever heard of naked short selling? But he was like, well, we have a small group of people trying to fight for stock market reform. So I would say to myself, hmm, I'm one of the dirty dozen. 
Good evening. Welcome to Where's My Stock? Re-energized, Darren began spreading the word about naked short selling on his own public access TV show in New York City. Around that time, the Dirty Dozen noticed something else happening on Wall Street, a rapidly growing but little known segment of the market known as hedge funds. Hedge fund. I got nothing. No hedge, but I got a lot of fun. That's all I got for you. It's a whole lot of fun. We'll work the hedge in later. Hedge funds are partnerships of extremely wealthy investors who pool large sums of money for speculating in the market. It's a risky business, and short selling is one of their most important strategies. The hedge fund industry grew from humble beginnings. In 1948, Alfred Winslow Jones earned the moniker the father of the hedge fund when he raised $100,000 and decided to hedge his bets in the market by short selling stock. He borrowed stocks and sold them at their current market price. If, as he suspected, the price declined, he bought the stock at the now lower price, replacing the borrowed stocks with the ones he'd bought and made a profit. It seemed like a sound strategy. The idea caught on. According to the New York Times, by 1990, hedge funds managed $40 billion, and 15 years later grew to an astronomical $1 trillion an increase of 2,500%. They've got a lot of capital. They tend to take very large bets, so their impact can be greater. By the late 2000s, it seemed like everyone was starting a hedge fund. And why not? While a mutual fund manager makes 1% or 2% off of total investments, hedge fund managers make 2% plus 20% of the profit. With individuals investing a minimum of a million dollars each, if you were a successful hedge fund manager, you were on the road to riches. By 2004, a third of the trading on the market was controlled by hedge funds. They drive stocks down, they drive stocks up, and they act in concert, kind of like uh, killer whales swimming around eating up the big whales. They can massively short a company um, over a period of two to three weeks and then get out of that company, reap enormous profits, and those are profits at the expense of other shareholders. We need to remember that 40% of the shares on American stock exchanges are held by public and private pension funds. So what we're talking about here are stock manipulators reducing the pensions of tens of millions of teachers, policemen, auto workers, steel workers, nurses, professors, America's large pension funds. The market should determine whether a stock rises or falls, not stock manipulators. In 2004, the SEC failed in their attempt to regulate hedge funds, and Congress followed the advice of then Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan, who at the time saw no significant purpose in regulating them. They can operate under the dark of night because there's very little regulation. There's very little disclosure. There is no transparency. You can't look at books. You can't see what they're doing. To provide even more secrecy, many hedge funds operate from offshore. Two thirds of all hedge funds are in Grand Cayman. They're in Grand Cayman because that protects them against anybody looking into what they're really doing. All of these things are there for the sake of powerful financial interests. With the lack of regulation in the foreign exchanges, all it takes is an aggressive hedge fund manager to game the system. You put it on a list. You say you can't sell the stock short. Oh, okay, gee, then maybe I can't call up London and sell stock short. Excuse me, hello? I'm getting up at four in the morning and I'm calling London and I'm selling the stock short. Oh no, I don't want to do that. Well, let me call Frankfurt. Oh, I want to get smart here. Let's try a new one. How about if I call Madrid and bounce it out of Madrid because I know they're going to sell it in London? There we go, folks. Now I'm short. Oh, and I'm using offshore accounts. <laughs> right? So I just, I'm using offshore accounts and offshore brokers. You never saw it. On February 15, 2004, there was a bust of 17 members of organized crime in New Jersey for racketeering. 
The arrest included bankers of Bryn Mawr Investment, who had been involved in the manipulation of Eagle Tech's stock. John Cerubo was named as a co-defendant. The investigation gave Wes Christian and John O'Quinn access to evidence connected to the Eagle Tech case. Rod Young would find that the actions of these brokers revealed the mechanics of fraud on Wall Street. We ended up with 24 boxes of uh, paper records. 50,000 pieces of paper, a CD with 43,000 trading records. What we found was just shocking. Those were the records that showed that the members of the Solomon Smith Barney financing, the options market makers from Chicago, were selling shares short, naked short, without a borrow, before they even signed the investment agreement, uh, which is insider trading at the worst. Uh, that's a criminal offense, uh, a felony. When a broker executes a trade, they use a clearing firm to make sure the trade settles through the DTCC. They were using the clearing firm, Goldman Sachs Execution and Clearing. They were selling the shares from one account, and they were flipping those shares to another account that had the title Flip Firm, which that should be a dead giveaway for any regulator, but they really didn't seem to mind that at all. It was a fake trading account used to reclassify the counterfeit shares as real shares to be sold to unsuspecting investors. From there, the shares went from flip firm to Knight Securities, where they changed gender from short to long, and they were sold to the public and ended up in people's IRAs and 401ks as long shares. But they were phantom shares. They didn't really exist. The value of those shares went from seven or eight bucks to near zero, and those people lost their, their retirement funds. I've got 50,000 pieces of paper in the garage that show all of the New York banking firms laundering money from the Bahamas through all the New York banks. They use different processes to move it offshore, to launder it, there were hundreds of investment banking firms offshore, just in the Bahamas. Then you have the Cayman Islands. If you have money, you can't just put it in a sock and bury it in the backyard. You have Bermuda. You need somebody to, first of all, wash it. So you need to do it banks overseas. Of course, you have Costa Rica. Um, now Barcelona, Spain is even opening up. They use such things as access cards to be able to get cash and thousands of dollars, unlimited amounts of money. There's a lot of money laundering that goes on. Did we pay certain people off? Absolutely. We had offshore accounts set up that were linked to offshore credit cards that uh, we would deposit 20s, 30s, $40,000 a week. Those cards didn't have anybody's names on them, but they had an account code. And this, these credit cards were freely used over here with no trail. They have all these things. It's already designed, you know? They designed it, they manufacture it. It's just two sides, the upper world and the underworld. What you call the legitimate banks in this country are the same banks that are in the, if you want to call it the underworld banks. Uh, we, we used major banks um, to open up hundreds of offshore accounts. Without them saying one thing, we sold stock through those offshore accounts without them even bringing up uh, a word of it to the government, without a letter being sent, without anything. We went from Scotia Bank to Bank of New York um, every day with tens and tens of millions of dollars. Did they know about it? Yeah. We're, we're on every stock sale. Were they getting a piece of it? Absolutely. There's nothing that's done in the underworld that's not done in the upper world. It's the same structure that's above ground, that's underground. You're using the same banks. As smaller companies continued to be destroyed, and as average investors on Main Street lost their shirts to naked short selling, 
John Harmer, a former California state senator and lieutenant governor under Ronald Reagan, became intrigued with this little known practice. Like most people in this country, when I first heard the term naked short selling, I had no clue as to what they were mentioning. But Harmer soon discovered that naked short selling had decimated the value of many small companies. I sat down with uh, uh, one individual who was able to go onto his computer and add, in real time show me what was happening into the stocks of several of these companies on that day as naked short selling was taking place. The evidence was astonishing. Everybody denied that it was brokers in the big brokerage houses that were doing it, but we were able to identify very clearly that that's exactly who was doing it, driving down the value of those stocks, driving the company out of business. A lot of that was going on without these CEOs knowing it, or they knew it was happening, but they just said, don't tell me about it. I don't want to know what the guys in the back room are doing. Harmer began to dig deeper to learn more about the fraud. And I turned all the sources I could think of, the internet, lawsuits, etc. Armed with this information, he took his concerns to the Senate Banking Committee, who had oversight of the SEC. I went to Senator Bennett in the Senate Banking Committee and brought to them then specific examples of the flagrancy of what was being done and the inaction by the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in the face of this evidence. Senator Bennett jumped on board, but Harmer and Bennett faced an uphill battle convincing other senators to even acknowledge the problem. They had no clue what I was talking about. And yet I would tell them, look, we're talking about the economic future of this country. We're talking about the segment of industry that produces the most jobs, small business. We need to keep them alive and well. And they're being destroyed by a very small group of predatory people who are using their power to make a fortune for themselves, a fortune that often isn't even taxed the way it works, and then walking away from the ashes. Harmer and Bennett continued their crusade to clean up Wall Street. Now, Senator Bennett, he was willing to go forward. He was committed. And in fact, we had this piece of legislation drafted. But just when it looked like Congress would finally take the lead against fraud on Wall Street, Harmer and Bennett ran into a stone wall, one erected by the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation. They have such enormous power. They are able to be totally off the record, totally invisible, but wield enormous impact upon what's going on. As the fails to deliver problem continued to escalate, advocates and economists began to take a closer look at the DTCC. Especially a process they used to clear the trades called the Stock Borrow Program. The broker looks for shares, can't find them, says to the seller, can't find the shares. He says, proceed. The DTC steps in, the stock borrow program essentially fills that role. And this is where critics believe the problem lies. When a broker transacts a short sale and no shares are available, the stock borrow program allows the transaction to go through without borrowing the stock from another shareholder's account. So there are now two sets of shares representing the same shares. Those shares appear electronically in both accounts. It's the same share. One of them is a phantom share. We know that the DTCC is clearing trades even when they can't locate the shares through the stock borrow program. In those cases, the stock borrow program claims their shares but never finds them. Since Suzanne Trimbeth first learned of the fraud in 1993, this little hole in the system has grown into a chasm. The DTCC, through its stock borrow program, has in effect created hundreds of millions of phantom shares. And it multiplies on a continual basis. On any given day, there are between 500 million and 1 billion shares have been sold and failed to deliver. Your stock is getting lent to this firm, to that firm, to this firm, to that firm. Each firm gives each other an IOU. But at the end of the day, if everybody went and claimed their stock and said, give me my physical certificates, they would not be able to do it. 
having spoken to people within the market who admitted that they were actually doing this, that they were taking advantage of this loophole, we realized that this was an immense problem. It's so big, it's so systemic, it involves people with so much money, multiple billionaires. Well, I wonder how they're making that much money. Well, I have my ideas from this activity. They operate from an inherent position of conflict of interest uh, in which their owners earn profits off of the transactions of uh, naked short sales. Why would we take an organization that's privately owned and put it in control of $30 trillion a month of transactions with essentially limited supervision? Who owns it? The New York Stock Exchange owns it. All the prime brokers own it. Its members just happen to be Wall Street. The same parties who would have to enforce delivery. And there's been no forced accountability. So the fox is watching the hen house. And the fox is eating all the eggs. Throughout 2005, John Harmer seemed to be making headway in Congress with his crusade against counterfeit shares in the stock market. Senator Bennett was very cooperative. Senator Shelby, who was, when the Republicans were in the majority, chairman of the committee, was very sympathetic. Other members of the committee took a great interest in what we were doing. But then, some complications started to tangle up the process. When we really got to a point where it looked like we were going to have hearings, one of the issues was the fact that the Depository Trust Clearing Corporation, that functioning as, as a totally independent entity in this with no regulation by the SEC, no regulation by anybody else, they were unresponsive to our inquiries. The DTCC um, really, in a surprising way, went public very aggressively, denying really their own data, denying the, the phenomenon itself, saying that it really didn't exist. They refused to provide the most basic data regarding naked short sales in their own stocks. It's their job to report that, that their employer is the brokerage house. Financial reporter and editor Helen Avery took her concerns to the Associate General Counsel of the DTCC, Larry Thompson. I asked him about the structure of the DTCC and whether it facilitated this duplication of shares in the stock borrow program. And I asked him whether he thought naked shorting was happening and whether there was any concern on his part about the companies that were being affected. And again, he echoed the SEC's point of view, which was these companies were very small, there were problems within these companies that were leading to their stock price declining, that it probably wasn't a result of naked shorting. John Harmer and many other crusaders believed they were getting an official brush off. Their tentacles go all over the country. And they were the ones, very frankly, who began to sabotage the work we were doing. The DTCC has stonewalled this issue for over a decade. There are billions and billions of dollars at stake in this, and that means there is enormous resistance to anything which might complicate the process, slow the process, in some cases shrink the process, like eliminating illegal naked short sales. The SEC, under Chairman William Donaldson, echoed the DTCC's opposition to congressional hearings into naked short selling. Essentially, he was contemptuous of the whole idea, you people shouldn't meddle in this, uh, you don't really know what you're getting into, leave it to us, uh, the members of the black priesthood, if you will, to, uh, to take care of it. Like the DTCC, Donaldson believed that Wall Street should essentially regulate itself. And behind the scenes, the SEC worked to derail the hearings Senator Bennett was trying to schedule. To him, the whole business of, the buy, of trading securities belongs to the major brokers. They're the ones who are running this. And you folks down in Washington should not meddle in this or you're going to upset the apple cart. The staff people from the SEC literally would say, well, Senator, we, we, we think that a hearing on that issue right now could be counterproductive, and so we're appealing to you to delay having the hearing until we are able to put into effect 
some regulations that we are considering, and we think those regulations will solve your problems. So instead of Congress, the SEC came up with its own regulation. The SEC proposed a, its first reform of the regulation of short sales called Reg Show, S-H-O for short sales, which actually went into effect in the beginning of 2005. Reg show rules require that broker-dealers have grounds to believe that shares will be available for a given stock transaction and stipulate that delivery take place within a limited time period, usually within three days. It also requires lists to be published that track stocks with unusually high trends and fail to deliver shares. Reg show uh, was created with good intentions. I believe it was created under serious pressure from Main Street. But Reg Show had serious shortcomings. Instead of disclosing the volume of fails and who's creating the fails, who's doing the naked short selling, all the SEC does is list the victim companies every day. It's bizarre. It's about as effective as trying to stop a string of bank robberies by making a list of the victimized banks. But the idea that Reg Show would be a magic bullet was weakening any momentum by Senator Bennett to pass new legislation in Congress. I said, Senator, all they are doing is stonewalling you. All they are doing is getting you to put this off. They kept raising these imaginary horribles and kept delaying us. Then one of the most powerful people in Washington got involved, Henry Paulson. Secretary Paulson, who was then Treasury Secretary, got into the act, all on the premise that these hearings could have a very negative effect upon the stock market if you're not careful in the way they go forward. Finally, under pressure from the SEC, Wall Street, the DTCC, and Treasury, the Senate Banking Committee caved, especially when Senate Banking Chairman Richard Shelby weighed in. They also got to Chairman Shelby. Shelby said to Bennett, uh, I think we ought to wait and give the SEC a chance to come in and explain their position. And so we were simply the victims of a very effectively executed strategy to make sure that there were no hearings on this and even to make sure that Senator Bennett did not introduce the bill. So the one time that Congress had an opportunity to force the SEC to stop naked short selling in the stock market, they instead sold out to the elusive powers on Wall Street. John Harmer added an ominous warning for anyone working to uncover the fraud. I was a proponent, but you would probably be a great risk personally if you had the data, which we don't, and then tried to expose it. With the failure of Congress to act, the Crusaders knew they would need some national exposure to get their issue off the back burner. And suddenly, it looked like that might happen. Dateline, one of the biggest investigative shows on TV, began piecing together a major expose that promised to blow the roof off the naked short selling scandal. NBC Dateline interviewed 25 people. They had uh, 75 hours of film. It was scheduled to air. It was confirmed by the producer that it was to air. The Crusaders hoped that after years of being ignored, the burning issue of naked short selling and massive fraud on Wall Street would finally be addressed before a national audience. But instead, Dateline aired a special about American Idol singing star Reuben Stuttered. When the story, which was scheduled for broadcast, suddenly got yanked in favor of Reuben Stuttered, it was apparent that something was going on. From our studio. On July 31st, 2005, after several other postponements, the Dateline expose finally aired was a nine and a half minute story uh, about Rod Young and Eagle Tech, and it was so watered down, the most scathing comment in the whole piece was that naked short selling may be illegal, and it's, it's a very complicated story. In fact, too complicated to tell here. 
and it was a joke. But naked short selling wasn't totally ignored by the media. In 2007, Bloomberg Television featured John O'Quinn's and Wes Christian's crusade against phantom shares and Wall Street fraud. But it still wasn't enough. With no one to stop them, the crooks began to attack larger companies. Companies like Overstock.com, an upstart online retail company run by Patrick Byrne. Overstock offered brand name merchandise at discount prices. There's this fringe of retail that most people don't ever know about. We realized we could bring all this stuff into Salt Lake City and blow it out on the internet. In 2002, Overstock went public, growing its revenue to over 500 million by 2004. Around that time, Patrick started to receive some unusual phone calls. People started contacting me, sending me emails, sometimes leaving me long voice messages, talking about this strange phenomenon going on on Wall Street. And I just delete, delete. I just didn't pay much attention. Sometimes I'd send a little email in response. Finally, this fellow got through to me and he talked to me for about an hour. I thought he was nuts. It all just sounded crazy and wacky, and at the end of the hour, I said, okay, well, thank you very much, and I basically gave him the brush off. And he said, I can tell, Patrick, that you don't believe me, so I'm just gonna make a few predictions, and when these predictions all come true, you call me. The predictions were that a handful of journalists would attack his company through the media, that Overstock would become the object of a federal investigation, that the company's stock would begin to trade on foreign exchanges, and that Overstock would appear on the then upcoming Reg Show list. Within about two weeks, all five of these journalists who he had predicted would call me, called me. I became the object of a very strange federal investigation that went nowhere and was dropped. Uh, we did start showing up on, you know, Bahamas and Bavaria and Australia and Stuttgart. And oddly enough, when the Reg Show list came out, which was January 3rd, I think, of 2005, we were not on it. And, uh, but we went on it about January 20th or 25th or so. So if somebody can make predictions like that that are so far out and they all come true, you have to go back and, and try to figure out what is it about the theory. Overstock wasn't the only larger company on the Reg Show list. The list also included hundreds of companies from the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and the American Stock Exchange. Maybe it started with small firms, but it was certainly going to move on to larger firms. And unless this was tackled, um, the implications for larger firms were going to be enormous. The, the Eagle Tax came the overstocks, where everybody isolated it to small microcap penny stocks. We found that it went far beyond that. These thieves, in my opinion, uh, saw that they could steal money by counterfeiting shares of the small companies. They simply just went up the food chain into bigger companies. I dug into it. I dug into it for about three or four months. I read, you know, economist papers, and I got textbooks, and I learned about the stock settlement system, and I talked to brokers. I kept on digging, expecting to find something that disconfirmed this theory, and the more I dug, the more everything confirmed it. Patrick realized that Overstock.com was now a target and had come under attack by unscrupulous Wall Street traders. I remember the precise moment when the light bulb went off. It clicked. I just felt sick to my stomach. I actually thought I may have lost my mind. It was a horrible feeling. It was like hearing that you have cancer or something, but it was like understanding the nation had cancer. This is a crack in our market that could bring down the country. Patrick hired attorneys O'Quinn and Christian to file lawsuits on behalf of Overstock, alleging that the hedge fund Rocker Partners conspired with a research firm to publish negative reports on Overstock and shorted the company before the reports were released. So imagine that traders are allowed to secretly influence independent research reports such that when the report comes out, it says the company's garbage every time. And not just one report came out quarterly, reports came out daily or weekly, repeatedly like shotgun blasts attempting to kill the company. 
In order to further drive the stock price down, O'Quinn and Christian believed that Rocker and other hedge funds were dumping phantom shares into the system through naked short selling. We certainly have evidence to show that there are many millions of shares of overstock that are out there that are not real. And that number increases every day as discovery is ongoing. On August 12th, 2005, Patrick Byrne held a conference call open to investors and the media. Normally reserved for financial matters, this one was different. It became known as the miscreant's ball. Good morning and welcome to Overstock.com's special conference call regarding the lawsuit that was filed on their behalf yesterday in the Superior Court of California. Thank you, Philip. Good morning. The miscreant's ball, August 12, 2005. It was basically our declaration of war on Wall Street. I believe Overstock has been damaged. Uh, and our damage model supports a number in the high hundreds of millions of dollars, perhaps more. During the call, Patrick laid out a complex scheme that he believed had national repercussions. We've got, I think, a group of parasites who have found a, a loophole that they can keep on using to just drain resources out of entrepreneurs in America and uh, in the process killing small companies. Patrick described in detail complex schemes and conspiracies listing dozens of people tangled in a web of deceit. But at times, his questionable choice of metaphors seemed to backfire on him. I started realizing and, and that there was actually some more orchestration here being provided by the fellow I'm calling here the Sith Lord or the mastermind. I'll just call him the master of mind today. In a conference call during uh, one of the recent earnings reporting periods, Patrick Byrne did talk about the conspiracy against the company. Being run by the, the Sith, Sith Lord. Lord. Boy, that sounds very strange. <laughs> kind of, I, about a year into it, somebody told me, you know that this is going to go down in the history of Wall Street, this, this fight. When they attacked his company, he didn't take it lying down. He got up and he blew the whistle in lots of ways. He got on television. As a result of Patrick's lawsuit against Rocker and others, the SEC subpoenaed several financial journalists. Patrick also publicly accused Herb Greenberg and Jim Cramer of being crooked reporters. Herb Greenberg, you've been in the game for a long time, longer than I have. How's it feel to be uh, called a crooked reporter on CNBC? Uh, it feels like the person who called me a crooked re uh, reporter on CNBC, uh, Patrick Byrne, mm -hmm. for the third time, has libeled me has defamed me, has slandered me, is getting in the way of me doing my job. I got the uh, yes subpoena from the government last week, too. Did you? Used my copy, yeah. I got it. You know why I got the subpoena? I got the subpoena because I've said negative things about a stock that I think is going lower. That's why I got that subpoena. It was clear that Patrick's lawsuit and conference call had triggered a major battle with the national media, one that would continue for years. When Patrick's battle began in 2005, Overstock had the revenues and available funding to fight back and was able to survive the onslaught of the media as well as the phantom shares dumped into the market. But Eagle Tech wasn't as lucky. The fraudulent manipulation of Eagle Tech's stock made it impossible for Rod Young to raise capital to fund his company. The SEC filed a suit against the victim, Eagle Tech Communications, uh, to deregister Eagle Tech shares because Eagle Tech couldn't any longer afford the several hundred thousand dollars a year that it takes to file audited financial reports. In February of 2005, the SEC initiated proceedings to have Eagle Tech delisted so that their stock could no longer be traded on the major exchanges. It has the effect of uh, a bankruptcy it virtually wipes out all the investors forever. And it's a gift to the uh, naked short sellers because then they never have to buy the shares to cover their shorts. In an unprecedented action, Rod Young was granted the right to present his case in front of the SEC commissioners on February 13, 2006. I believe that the SEC, the DTCC, the Federal Reserve, and members of Congress all share responsibility for failing to respond to tens of thousands of complaints of wrongful conduct 
from victimized companies and their shareholders. I contend that if you had spent but a fraction of the resources that, you've, that you have spent on this proceeding on investigating just one complaint of manipulation, you would have saved some innocent shareholder the loss of his pension savings or his child their education fund. I have just one question to ask you. When are you going to do your job? They wanted to get me out of there and get on with business as usual. On July 5th, 2006, Eagle Tech Communications' status as a publicly traded company was permanently revoked. That was the last communication with them, and then several months later, they uh, issued their opinion, and it was over. Naked short selling and fraud had destroyed Rod's chances of bringing a new and useful product to the American public. Meanwhile, the same practices were destroying Virogen. Despite extremely positive trials for its key cancer drug, Omniferon, naked short selling had decimated Virogen's stock price. It simply didn't have the funding to bring their revolutionary cancer treatments to the market. One of the people who might have benefited from Virogen was one of its most ardent supporters, Darren Saunders. Darren had originally taken to the airwaves to spread the word about naked short selling. But tonight, in his own unique way, the show would be very personal. Good evening. Welcome to Access for All. I'm your host, Darren Saunders. I've been doing shows for about three years about a small cancer company out of, Vi out of Florida, Plantation, Florida, called Virogen. I was diagnosed with colorectal cancer in March, and the last few months have been quite an experience. I went to the doctor, and the doctor told me that I could have one of two things. I could have either colitis or cancer. And when he said that to me, I knew for sure it was cancer because I had pain in my back that was unbelievable. If the lesions on my liver are cancerous, they say I have between two and three more years left of life. If, God forbid, something should happen to me and the cancer should take me, at least you'll have these shows to come back to to look at what a problem we have in the financial world here. Meanwhile, Patrick Byrne's battle with the media intensified as he continued to allege that financial journalists conspired with certain hedge funds to push down the stock price of his company and others. When you start following it, journalist by journalist and hedge fund by hedge fund, it's hard not to see what looks like a lot of cooperation. And then now, of course, we're in lawsuits where I'm getting discovery and I'm seeing the emails between journalists and hedge funds and, and uh, it's mind-blowing. After sounding the battle cry of journalistic integrity loudest of all, CNBC star Jim Cramer was seen on the internet telling another journalist how his hedge fund tried to manipulate the market. I have to talk about what it's like at my hedge fund, okay, because, and what other hedge funds do. We have a tape where Cramer's talking about when he ran a hedge fund, how he broke the law. You know, a lot of times when I was short, at my hedge fund and I was positioned short, meaning I needed it down, uh, I would uh, create a, um, a level of activity beforehand that could drive the futures. It doesn't take much money. And he's advocating breaking the law and telling people to break the law. Uh, what you're seeing now is maybe, it probably is a bigger market now, maybe you need 10 million in capital to knock this stuff down, but it's a fun game and it's a l lucrative game. I mean, the SEC won't figure it out. So he's a crook. You can't create a yourself an impression that a stock's down. But you do it anyway because the SEC doesn't right. understand it. They're sociopaths. They're just absolute sociopaths. What's important when you're in that hedge fund mode is to not do anything remotely truthful. Because the truth is so against your view right. that it's important to create a new truth to develop a fiction. And um, this is actually just lately illegal. He's a crook. Hope you quote me on that. But the hedge funds and the journalists won this round. After Kramer and the other reporters blatantly refused to comply, SEC Chairman Christopher Cox overruled his own attorneys and ruled the subpoenas would not be enforced. We've received from the Securities and Exchange Commission under subpoena 
evidence that the SEC had gathered on their own. I think that we're living at the edge of a 1929 kind of disaster. The Dirty Dozen continued with their tireless crusade. But for the most part, the media either ignored the issues or sided with the crooks. We spent years, oh my God, we spent years trying to get the media to cover this. And someone just to say the words naked short selling or fails to deliver or market fraud, all of us are saying this is a ticking time bomb. Nobody cares. It is a record setting day on Wall Street. Enticed by the lack of regulation and the potential for enormous profits, it wasn't long before the major banks began to take over the hedge fund industry. By 2007, the two largest hedge funds in the world were J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs, and their bets were paying off as the market was hitting an all-time high of 14,000 points. We're right on pace now for the best closing level we've had in six and a half years. Any momentum to bring awareness to the fraud in the financial system seemed to stall. I actually thought the problem was fixable. I mean, I laughed looking back to the early days. I thought this was gonna be a three month fight. I thought we had, we have the data, we have the proof it's going on, we're just gonna expose it, and it's all gonna take care of itself. But as the months grew into years of trying to warn anyone who would listen of an impending financial collapse, the advocates were getting increasingly frustrated. The real issue is that nobody wants to do anything about it and that as long as the money was flowing, nobody gave a damn. Nobody cared that the little investor was losing everything. But then in 2008, the money stopped flowing and the economy began to crumble. In March 2008, just before the collapse as naked short sellers continued to pummel the market, the SEC finally took action. This recommendation, if we adopt it today, will put in place a new anti-fraud rule, specifically aimed at the abusive and manipulative practice called naked short selling. Today's elaborate system of electronic net settlement has enabled a particularly pernicious form of fraud called naked short selling. In July of 2008, as the economy continued its death spiral, the SEC declared a ban on naked short selling in the securities of 19 battered financial firms. Wall Street uh, being shaken to its core today. Lehman Brothers filing for bankruptcy. In September, after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the SEC expanded the ban to include all short selling in 799 financial companies. But it was too late. The economy crashed. When you see well, that I'm talking about naked short selling, finally, I'd like to go over there and smack them silly and tell them, why didn't you listen to us? With the crisis worsening daily, suddenly naked short selling was real, and the bullies in the playground were now begging the SEC to protect them from something that up until then, they denied even existed. Richard Fold, the former CEO of Lehman Brothers, even got into the act. Naked short sellers targeted financial institutions and spread rumors and false information. The impact of this market manipulation became self-fulfilling as short sellers drove down the stock prices of financial firms. In the end, despite all of our efforts, we were overwhelmed. However, what happened to Lehman Brothers could have happened to any financial institution and almost did happen to others. There's a little Shakespearean irony in that because many of them were enabling hedge funds to do this against everybody else. By the time of the collapse of Lehman Brothers and earlier of Bear Stearns, the naked short sales accounted for approximately half of all the shorts out against these companies. And what that meant was that unscrupulous investors could, in effect, create millions and millions and millions of shares and really flood the market. You look at the last three days of trade and you see the fails to deliver spiking up hugely by something like 3,500 percent, okay? Those people who sold and who failed to deliver all got money for selling those shares, okay? But they never delivered any shares. 
Naked short. Naked short. Naked short selling. After the meltdown in 2008, the media, the government, and even Wall Street changed their tune on naked short selling. It seemed the Dirty Dozen's claims had been justified. And then one day, it's all over the news. The same people we had been sending stuff to for years and years and years are saying, we've just discovered naked short selling, and Congress is going, oh my God, there's something called naked short selling. This is horrible. We're going to stop this, blah, 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 blah. Somebody asked me if you feel vindicated because of this. How would I feel vindicated? You know, look at all the lives that have been ruined. The only reason why we were speaking about it in the past is because we wanted to save these people. We wanted to save them from what happened to us. What happened to me? I don't want to happen to anybody. So now that it's happening to everybody, I could think of so many other words, and vindication is not one of them. To make sense of the collapse, on May 20th, 2009, Congress created the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, or FCIC, to examine the causes of the financial and economic crisis. We were invited before the FCIC, and they wanted to know everything we had learned. They wanted all these documents that we've gotten through our court cases. We know for an absolute fact, Goldman Sachs, their lobbyists got in and got the FCIC to carve back what they were allowed to talk to us about. We were only allowed to give the FCIC a book about this big of various documents and have two hours with them to explain what we have learned through five years of this fighting. But research by Suzanne Trimbath and other academics has revealed that at the time of the economic crash, manipulation and fraud wasn't only occurring in the stock market. There were massive fails to deliver in the bond market as well. Wall Street was selling trillions and trillions of dollars worth of bonds that didn't exist, including packaged mortgages sold as bonds and the insurance that covered them. The mortgage crisis was largely created not by bad home loans, but by bad bets by Wall Street. And when the banks lost their bets, we all had to pay. When I'm watching this foreclosure crisis, I'm just thinking, well, this is exactly what we were talking about in the naked short selling crisis. It's all fundamentally the same issue. You've got fuzzy chains of title, whether you're talking about mortgages and mortgage bonds, or whether you're talking about stocks, it's the same thing. Like the stock market, almost every trade in the municipal bond, corporate bond, and mortgage bond markets is cleared by the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. And it should be clear by now that the structure that they have is what has allowed and sustained this to happen, and therefore I do not expect them to be part of the solution. But in this catastrophe, there is plenty of blame to go around. The people who are implicated in this are the wealthiest, have the deepest pools of money in the world. They cannot be outgunned financially. Two years later, no one's been charged with anything. Doesn't that seem odd? It seems odd to me. So I don't think they're gonna be held accountable. Well, the money can't be recovered. The only question is, what do we do going forward? In the past few years, the Wall Street banks, who are also the major brokers, have become so intertwined with hedge funds, it's hard to tell which is which. As long as the money kept flowing, they didn't give a damn. The only reason people started dealing with it is because the money train drove off a cliff. Not America drove off a cliff, the money train drove off a cliff. The Security and Exchange Commission also has blood on its hands. The SEC exists to protect the integrity of financial markets. That's its whole reason for being. By protecting the integrity of those markets, protecting the investors. And the SEC failed at that for at least 15 years. But Congress turned a blind eye to the fraud as well. They're there to make sure that our capital markets are run safely and smoothly. And safe means safe for all investors, not just safe for the big investors, the institutions, the guys that make all the money. And Congress is to blame for the fact that they don't recognize that both people have equal rights. 
since the meltdown, most Americans continue to struggle in uncertain times. But on Wall Street, the money train is back on track and full speed ahead. They've made theirs. And when it crashes, guess what? They're making money on the way down. And then we gave them the bailout, and what did they do? They made money on the way back up. And then they said, look, the market's good, the economy's great. In July 2010, President Obama signed into law FINREG, a financial reform act aimed at curbing abusive practices on Wall Street. To those who had dedicated years to sounding the alarm, it was too little, too late. The scope of the problem is not just naked short selling of stock. It applies in bonds, it applies in everything. Did FINREG address any of those sales of assets that aren't delivered? The answer to that would be, hell no, it didn't. We can end naked short selling tomorrow. Other countries have done this. They've changed their whole regulatory system in Europe. They've, they've taken steps to stop this. It's just in the US, the banks are too powerful. They won't let Washington really shut down and close off all those loopholes. They could stop it tomorrow simply by requiring that a person borrow the shares before they sell them. The end. The years dedicated to fighting fraud on Wall Street has taken a toll on the Crusaders. It's impacted my family greatly in the sense that it's required an enormous amount of my time. Because for every two of us, there's 30 to 40 of them. This has cost me a lot of time my family. I love being an advocate. My family doesn't. My family uh, has paid a heavy price. Cut. It's, um, it's emotionally draining for all of us. You, you put so much into something and, and you think, well, what do I do now? Do I admit failure and walk away from it? I, I, I'm not capable of doing that. And I'm here because a cancer company got killed by traitors, and I'm here to stop. During his crusade against fraud on Wall Street, Darren Saunders was one of the most vocal of the Dirty Dozen. But in 2010, Darren's battle against cancer had finally overwhelmed him. The thing that's so funny about this now, after all of this, and the reason why I've been through so much is because I've been battling for Viagen for so long. So now, after all this time, battling for a company with a cure for cancer, to have cancer beat me, it, that's not a perfect end. That's not a good ending to my film. After 15 years of standing up for what he believed in, Darren Saunders passed away on May 23rd, 2010. Darren was a hero. It's a shame that Darren is gone. He brought all of us together. I became one of those dirty dozen that he talks about. Darren isn't the only member of the dirty dozen who is no longer with us. In October 2009, lawyer John O'Quinn died in a car crash. When John passed away, it was like uh, a part of me died. I lost a mentor. I lost somebody that stood so tall in the forest, he was over the trees. We lost such a huge hero that really it's impossible to replace. John O'Quinn's death had a major impact on Eagle Tech's legal efforts as well. There are very few attorneys in the country that are capable of doing business the way that John did business. I knew that at some point, without John's commitment to this, that it would all start to fall apart, and it has. With O'Quinn's passing, Rod Young has been forced to seek other legal representation in his lawsuit against the major banks that contributed to the destruction of his company. The Dirty Dozen may have lost some members, but their cause, their spirit, their ideals, and their call to arms lives on. The bad guys not only looted America's savings accounts in retirement, 
they stole jobs from people from working families who are now on welfare or who lost their house or couldn't send their kid to college. So the consequences are enormous. I think we've just had the first taste of what's to come in this country. It's gonna take another crisis before it gets addressed and each crisis is gonna get worse. This is an ongoing battle. I think as Americans, we have to understand historically, if we are not diligent all the time, our way of life is always in danger of ending. Without a congressional mandate, which will not come in until there's a grassroots mandate from the people, it's not going to change. And so millions of jobs will not be created. Hundreds of billions of dollars in tax revenue to the federal government will not come from companies that aren't making a profit because they're not in existence and workers who are not paying taxes because they don't have jobs. We've lost control of our system. If that's the case, what can we see down the road? We've got to see not evolution of the society, correcting the new problems that are coming. I think we're going to produce a situation, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not the next day, but someday and soon, we're going to see a revolution. The ruin and the harm of this is not over. And uh, God is my witness. I'm more resentful about something that hurts my children and my grandchildren than I am about something that happens to me. And then our responsibility is to make sure that the world is safe for them.
Don't you feel it causing me to send you 